Zivu uh, uh, have put on this um, webinar, which obviously is about listing properties on uh, multiple online travel agents, so OTAs, and we've got uh, three panelists to uh, talk us through some of their pros, cons, experiences um, on doing that. And we've got a number of questions that we've also um, had ahead of the webinar to, to go through. We should be finishing about 10 past seven um, and uh, want to kind of allow about 15 minutes open Q and A. So um, we will just, I will try and manage time, but also try not to cut across the conversation because I think um, if we start getting into some of the detail, it'll be quite interesting. I think we lost Naomi. You take over Charlotte. <laughs> yeah, I've been host before, but this is not, <laughs> hence why I'm a panelist this time. <laughs> Well, let's get started with introductions because I don't know either of you. Charlotte, why don't you kick it off? Yeah, sure. All righty. Hello, my name is Charlotte. Um, I am the owner of Boutique Rooms. Uh, we operate in Huntingdonshire, forward slash Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. I've been doing this for about four years, so I'm still a little bit of a spring, ch spring chicken and I only have eight units, but hopefully I'll be able to add some wisdom to this panelist. How about you guys? Um, I'll go next uh, because I think Dave outlasted me by one year in terms of how long we've been doing this. I entered the vacation rental industry in 2006. Um, I was traveling down to Central America, specifically the Republic of Panama. Uh, if anybody has ever visited Panama, there's a beautiful little historic district there. That is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. However, it had been left to, de to decay over decades. And when I first visited Casco Viejo, I was completely smitten with the potential of this neighborhood. I stayed in a vacation rental. It was the only nice place to stay in town. The only other option was a little $2 hostel. And I fell in love with this place. And it was the vacation rental that sort of facilitated that experience. Uh, fast forward to about a year later, I ended up purchasing the vacation rental company from the previous owners who were from Holland and got to enjoy a good six years of being the only nice place to stay in town, which competition wise makes for a lovely, lovely learning environment. Uh, like Dave, this is way before the days of Airbnb. Uh, so most of my marketing lessons uh, came from doing stuff the old fashioned way and building a meaningful brand and giving people really amazing experiences. I have since exited the vacation rental management company and focused full time on the educational side of the industry, basically sharing uh, what I did right and wrong and also connecting uh, other people who are leading their respective markets. I noticed on the line here is Pam from Sonoma County, California. So we really are reaching across borders here uh, and it's really neat to be here. That's amazing. Um, my name is Dave and I'm the founder of a company called Central Belfast Apartments. And we're an Airbnb management company based in Belfast. So we work with property owners who want to earn money from Airbnb or, or service accommodation, but don't have the time or the expertise. Um, my journey in Airbnb started about 15 years ago, beat, beat map by one year. Um, I used to help out my parents whenever they had a few, um, I think they called them self-catering apartments back then. And um, no one was really coming to Belfast, so we were really grateful for anyone who did. And I'm really passionate about the city. Don't know if anyone on the call has been, but it has a lot to offer, but it gets a bit of a bad rap due to our troubled history. So I loved sharing that passion with guests when they arrived and, and seeing how delighted they were with the city on their first visit. Um, and that's sort of stuck with me ever since. And, and now I do quite a lot of video content showcasing the city. And um, if anyone's on TikTok, you should check some of our stuff out as well. Um, we've grown over the years to, well, we, we shrank in during the pandemic, but we've grown sort of at a faster rate than ever before. And we're upwards of 60 properties at the minute um, and hosted tens and tens of thousands of guests. And I've got a small team, five that sort of run the day-to-day -day of the business. It enables me to do 
the fun things like do TikToks about finding the best Guinness in Belfast. Um, I also do a bit of coaching about helping people who want to get started but don't know how and are a bit overwhelmed. Um, and I've written a book called The Service Accommodation, Five Star Fundamentals, which sort of distills down everything that you need to run an Airbnb business in the five easy to remember things. Um, so that's me. I'm looking forward to, to chatting to everyone. So I'm just going to go right into our topics because we could probably talk about these on our own for hours. We have two unique perspectives here. One is from two people who were in the business way before Airbnb ever existed. And one, Charlotte, who I'm guessing it's played a central role in your marketing from the beginning. So let's start with Dave. You remember back in the days before Airbnb certainly existed, maybe were you experimenting with other OTAs and how has the role of the OTA changed fast forwarding to today? Well, back then, certainly in Belfast anyway, there were no OTAs. It was literally, we had a tourist board and you could list your property on that and then people would phone you and, and say, do you have availability? So it was certainly not very efficient. Um, and I remember when when Airbnb came and, and we, we got our first properties on it, just the, the efficiency of bookings coming in, of being able to, to display your, your property to millions of people straight away and where they you knew there was a one-stop shop where most people were going to look. Um, and, you know, these, these OTAs, they do work extremely hard because they want to keep those guests on their platform. So they work hard to sell your property because they want their commission and they don't want you to go, they don't want the guests to go and use a different one. Um, but certainly as they've, as more and more have came on, it's it's got more and more of a headache because it used to just be Airbnb and in Belfast anyway, we were one of the early adopters to get on to booking.com. And even still now, the vast majority of people are on Airbnb in Belfast, but not booking.com. And I think it's because it's a bit more scary. There's no inquiries. They just come in. You don't see past reviews or anything. Bookings just land in and you have to take them. Um, but certainly as more and more have come on and each of them have their own little policies and things the way they, they like to do things, it, it can be a bit more of a headache to try and get your head around everything and be on top of it all. Um, but it goes back to what I, I said at the start. It's it's all about efficiency because the, the, the bigger you grow, the more properties you have, the more guests you have, it needs to be an efficient system. So any OTA that can fit in our system and, and work well, we're on there. And I think that describes me too. Back in the day, we were a very small team and we experimented with a couple of listing sites, booking, Expedia. And these were people who were booking last minute stays for a neighborhood that is not for everybody. Like this place is very unique. And these last minute stays, the guests would come in and it would not be what they were expecting. Our properties were certainly not what they were expecting. It was a terrible experience for both of us because we were kind of cornered into this arrangement. We ended up kind of pulling the plug on most of those experiments. Uh, that actually ended up being kind of the nexus of my marketing philosophy is that listing sites are great. You got to use whatever's available today, but at the same time, build your own uh, build your own race course. Charlotte, when you entered, was it Airbnb right off the bat, front and center? Pretty much, yeah. It was Airbnb for most, uh, well, all of my properties now. Um, but, you know, I wasn't scared. I uh, immediately was on Booking.com, Expedia, and their family brands as well. So, I kind of just went a bit crazy, but I guess there's like some cons to just whacking your property everywhere as well. And do you use any kind of like um, testing process to ensure which you're going to keep and double down on as opposed to which you pull from the portfolio? I think now I've got to the point where, you know, I think I really understand my guest and I kind of know where they're coming from and what kind of, what type of person they are, what, you know, what kind of brand loyalty do they have to the likes of like Airbnb and booking.com and things like that. So I kind of, you know, I do look at it as an overall and some I just risk to leave there just for the like the marketing, so to speak, in terms of it really being free because I'm not paying any commission. Um, but obviously with the algorithms that gets pushed down, 
but eventually if something really really doesn't work we just pull it because there's really no point pushing to somebody who doesn't want your product and does your strategy encompass the big ones as a as a, in addition to niche and special interest geographic yeah i do i do um particularly like a small company called finest retreats uh they came and headhunted us so to speak but they're a really small niche kind of um, OTA at the moment. Um, and I've really enjoyed working with them. I think because you have like your new, smaller niche kind of OTAs, they're more, I don't know. I feel like you can have a conversation with the account manager. They really give you more. They, you can really pull a lot of information from them. It's a more personable experience rather than the likes of Airbnb and booking.com where it's very impersonable. It's very just standard information. We're not really going to give you too much. Um, I don't have an account manager on uh, booking.com, Dave, you may, but I haven't had in terms of getting what I need from the OTAs, um, in terms of how to market better for them. I don't really feel like I get that from the bigger brands. Well, would you mind adding that, uh, that listing site to the chat? And also anyone else who's listening, if you have a listing site that you have found great use of, please add it to the chat in a little text to everybody. Dave, I want your opinion on how you're uh, using these channels in your strategy as well. So from, from my point of view, we absolutely machine gun the internet. We want to be on everywhere. You know, it's a very, the internet is a big place. There's a lot of noise to cut through. Um, and we want to make sure that every OTA out there has us on there. Like Charlotte said, it's, it's free marketing. And if they don't get you any bookings, well, you're still showing up. Um, I fully agree with what Charlotte said of that a smaller OTA is great in the fact that you can speak to someone. We do have an account manager at booking.com and that is invaluable in terms of actually speaking to someone. When you phone the booking.com customer service, you know, it's Russian roulette or, or lottery about which country you're going to end up in. And often they don't really know exactly what you're trying to tell them or, or come up with a solution. And trying to get in contact with anyone on Airbnb on the phone is, is impossible as well. So for me, it's um, it's so important to get yourself everywhere, but not even just the OTAs. I mean, social media as well. I think building your own brand out with the OTAs because they, they offer such limited capacity to to get a brand across on their system because they have to have a one size that fits all so by really utilizing social media and your own website to take direct bookings i think is key but certainly from my point of view it has to be on everywhere i remember when i first purchased my vacation rental business the uh, former owners was a gay couple and they had our properties listed on uh, purpleroofs.com which I'll add to the chat and gayjourney.com. And we had so many guests coming to stay with us through this niche listing site because it was the only listing site. We were the only place in all of Panama City that was uh, listed. And of course, when it came time to renew, I was like, we got to double down on this is a huge niche simply because when people chose to stay with us, they know they were going to feel safe. And that's a crazy thing for me to wrap my head around, but I'm curious if you guys had any other similar niche, whether it's a special interest niche, or uh, I know you, you shared Charlotte finest retreats. Have there been any other channels that tap sort of particular communities that seem to resonate with you? I haven't really gone down the niche route other than finest retreats. Potentially, I'm in talks with the plum guide at the moment as well. Um, but other than that, I haven't actually really tried, so I can't really comment. Um, and for me, no, we haven't got any sort of niche things like that. It's really interesting um, case study you talked about there, Matt. But one thing we do is link up with our um there's an industry body a tourism body in belfast called visit belfast and we can partner up with them and you know they are a little like an ota but different in the fact that they are promoting the entire city in terms of 
like things to do, hospitality, everything, events, and, and we can partner with them and, and get access to all the eyeballs that are on their site, just about general Belfast, and they can direct them to us as well. So I suppose that's more of a, a geographical niche, maybe in, in each, um, any people on the call, they might have a, a tourism body or something that they can link up with. And, and you know, that, that sort of partnership, once you're, once you're mentioned in the same breath as them or, or shared on our website, it gives you and your website a lot more credibility. Excellent. And it looks like Na Naomi's back. Naomi, we covered the first um, question and we're halfway into question two. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what happens. I'm connected. So I've had to shut everything down and restart. So I'm hoping no I'm here. So my apologies. Um, no so, worries. Uh, so we're partway through question two then. Is that right? Yeah, I wanted to challenge um, our other uh, panelists with a little theory that I've been working on, which dives a little bit deeper into beyond just what's your strategy with panel, channel uh, distribution is where does channel distribution fit in the broader marketing portfolio? Because you can be exceptional at channel distribution, but if you're not doing anything once the guest arrives, to ensure that they have the chance to either stay with you again or refer a friend, um, then you're kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy there. So I'm starting to think that the hospitality gestures and the interactions that take place from the moment a booking is made to the arrival, to the stay itself, to the departure, I'm starting to look at those activities as the new marketing. Because if we do a great job with those things, if we allocate new marketing resources to that portion of the customer journey, then not only are we getting the most out of all the OTAs that are unbelievable, but we're also um, compounding that investment because the, the lead that came from outside is now in our court. Dave or Charlotte, do either of those things sound like they resonate? And what do you do? Charlotte, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I mean, for sure, for me, I do. I, I agree with you that the rest of the, just because the guest or the customer books through the OTA, it's a perfect time for you to use your customer journey through the sense of whether it be push notifications, notifications, SMS, telephone. That's a really good point that you make in terms of that entire process is also part of the marketing. Do we use um, it? Yeah, well, of course we do. We always link it back to our direct website. Um, any kind of marketing, regardless of where they book from, you'll always find different services, different things that they can do. We also do a blog and things like that. So we always manage to always send it back to our website. But in terms of that, yeah. <laughs> I agree. I think we all have a love-hate relationship with OTAs. We would all we all love the bookings they bring in, but we all hate the 15 or 18 percent commission that we have to pay for them. Um, and I think in some areas and for some properties where you rely heavily on business travel or contractors coming to work on building sites where there's a lot of repeat business, yeah, the, you know, use the booking site once and then there are guests now. They're not they don't belong to booking.com or Airbnb anymore. And you know, if you can um, if the guest wants to come back, certainly offering a discount of what they would pay um, if, if they paid on booking.com and you had to pay the commission to them. It can be a bit trickier whenever it's a, a, a leisure destination and you might have someone come and, you know, if I went to visit Miami um, this week, it might be a while before I come back there. But certainly if any other people that were going, I would recommend they go direct to you. Um, but that's, that's the power of the OTAs. They churn those guests out. I don't know where they find them. They must spend millions on marketing and we cannot compete with that as hosts. All we can do is to try and wrestle back control. Once the guest has come and stayed in our place and liked it, then they're ours now. Yes, my... And can I just say, Dave, I love on your website, people hate on the fact that we call it an Airbnb and I get that. But I love how you kind of piggyback on that you said our award-winning Airbnb apartments are the best hotel alternative. It's like taking something that they have in their head and helping them see a new light. I love that. <laughs> it's good for SEO that you have to write Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> you do. There's, um, I think, you know, Airbnb and booking.com like or love them. And I like one of them and not the other. 
um, I won't name which one, but um, their advertising spend and marketing reach is, is phenomenal and it's more than mine will ever be, nor do I want to be. And actually, if I'm going to be spending that kind of money, um, you know, it, it, it's actually a lot cheaper to pay the commission. Um, we, we find, I'd have to say probably 99 in fact, maybe even 100% of all bookings that are repeat, they are direct. And um, we, we are quite hands-on with our guests in terms of the communications um, and checking in on them and not overkill, but trying to create a bit more of a personal link that isn't just via the OTA. So I think, Matt, what you're saying is using those opportunities once they've made their bookings to create a bit more of a personal experience. Um, it helps if you like doing that, but also we find that it's just led to just huge amounts of repeat booking. We are quite a contract market, so um, that in particular um, does help. And I'm finding actually contractors are a lot more savvy around using airbnb and booking.com as the first entry point and then they understand that we will um, provide much better rates so reduce some of the commission down so it becomes a bit more of a win-win um, so we we absolutely I, I don't actually have an issue using the OTAs and paying that kind of upfront um, because for me it's just the inlet into much bigger business going forward so I think Matt you're right just to harness that and then turn that to your advantage is not too difficult, but it would be a huge missed opportunity not to not to do that, particularly when I view it as that commission being my advertising spend. <laughs> so mm. therefore, I'm going to make it work for me. Everybody should know, by the way, how much it costs to acquire a new booking and how much it costs to acquire a repeat or a referral booking. Mm. It suddenly opens up your eyes to some money that you can play around with in terms of special touches and stuff. If I can just um, yeah. take the point forward from, from what Naomi said, um, the, the booking sites, especially with contractors, in particular booking.com, they're getting savvy to what we're doing and what I talked about there about repeat business. And now they're rewarding guests who, who book frequently like contractors or business travel by giving them actual money off that they can only use via, via booking.com. So, like we don't have to give them a discount but booking.com pays for a portion of their stay so often the discount that we offer those guests they'll just come back and say well actually booking.com is going to knock off more than that if we keep booking through them they're so smart and another point about that's uh, very interesting actually yeah another point about the market and spend is they will actually compete and outbid you on your own name if you try and run google ads <laughs> for your name and, and wherever it is, your property name, booking.com will pay more than you so that booking.com's listing for your property will show up before your own website. So it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a tough act. It is, it is. And so there's little extras, like we don't, we miss revenue opportunities with early check-ins, late checkouts, and then offer those sort of complimentary where we know that we've got contractors staying for a longer period. We offer them storage, you know, to kind of, if you want to leave your stuff over the weekend when we've got bookings, that sort of stuff. So we tend to be um, much more flexible with our contractors than actually our leisure um, guests, because obviously they lead to much bigger bookings. Um, and the moment you can build a relationship with either directly that um, and uh, or the person making the booking, it, it, it does become a lot easier. But that's interesting, David. <laughs> I didn't realize the OTAs are quite as savvy. And yeah, you can I'm steal saying. that tip, by the way. Choose your nearest competitor, run a paid ad campaign for their keyword name. It's gonna, you're competing with some of these bigger players, but that's a legit strategy that, you, that we can use. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna steal Dave's. <laughs> <laughs> so lead, leading on I suppose from that then in terms of uh, that question um, uh, we've sort of started to talk about but how can you get the most out of your sort of your preferred or your favorite um, OTAs and I suppose that's when you're initially trying to sort of generate those bookings so I'll open it up Does Anybody particular for me, best? Okay. for me, you've got to, if you have a favorite and you really want to get the absolute most out of it, and that's your number one goal, you need to be 
inside of that um, tool, you need to know how the algorithms are changing. You probably need to have somebody on it full time if you have a, other responsibilities. There are so many changes and it, it, it's, it almost feels like a treadmill at times that you're trying to keep up with all these changes. So I'm just, I'm always quick to caution anybody from going too deep down that rabbit hole because for every potential upside that it may bring you, it's taking time and focus away from the stuff that is in your control. So while I'm sure there are um, plenty of people on this call that have a favorite listing site and there is some room for improvement, uh, which we can talk about things like um, copywriting, uh, titles and descriptions and photography and stuff like that. I'm always just quick to caution that your time is very valuable and knowing where you're investing it uh, is important. Dave, Charlotte, have you got anything to add? I would agree with Matt is, is be in the system, be in the back end and making sure you know, you're using the, the OTA's functionality the way they want it to be used. That's how you, you get your, your page, your listing score up to 100%, which they like, and their algorithm will reward you. Um, and again, he's right that often they'll just bring in, you'll go in and you'll be like, oh my God, a whole new page has appeared in the back end of the booking.com extranet, and I have all my boxes unticked again. So it's just about keep going in there, keep exploring and looking around um, they love they love it when you use their offers um, of course they do because that's going to keep more guests on their platform as opposed to a, a competing platform and one thing I find is you can if you're if you're being encouraged to offer a, a specific offer or a discount by putting your price up by that corresponding amount and then turning on that discount so your price actually stays the same you still get that boost in the algorithm so it's all about being crafty and trying to use them instead of them using us. Yeah. To follow on from that as well, although it's great to know your back end and your dashboard for sure, um, if you have some time or if you have a VA, for example, uh, give the OTAs a call. They surprise me sometimes, although most of the time not very helpful. When I do or have done in the past, I have my VA do that now, just asking like, you know, my bookings are a little bit slow. What can I do? They normally give you some like good hints, tips. Um, for example, I didn't know uh, there was a booster like a certain dates on Airbnb. I didn't know there was that function until I was told by somebody on the phone. So, you know, you get little cheeky nuggets from them as well. So that would help to your advantage. I think that's a really good point, Charlotte, because as you're saying, the, uh, the, the platforms change all the time. And actually that's a job in itself, isn't it? To, to, to keep on top of that. Um, so it's actually a really good idea if you do find somebody helpful. And it, it, sometimes it's a bit of a flip of a coin. But, you're kidding me. Um, yeah. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Someone but, in the um, text box, Pam, just said that she did the same thing with VRBO and she got great advice for adding content and local flavors, to, flavor to descriptions. So there you go. That's great. Yeah, that's really, really good advice. So um, in terms of your experience, do you, do you three have a preferred channel and why is that? Um, so what kind of, how does that work best for your particular business model or your strategy i'm happy to go first on this one um for me it would be booking.com um they they they're such a professional outfit um they are as i said are a juggernaut of marketing you could cancel a booking and within half an hour the same dates are booked again by someone else um we have an account manager so we feel like there is a bit of a actual relationship with them and we can get sort of ideas about what's coming down the tracks. Um, they, if you have your policies right, they will side with you. Whereas I think some of the other ones tend to side with guests a bit more. Um, and yeah, we would just get most of our bookings through there. So that's probably my preferred one. What, what sort of size are you, Dave? So Is we've got um, upwards of 60 properties. Okay. Ranging from serviced rooms all the way up to five bed penthouse apartments. Um, the functionality is very easy on that as well. 
you know, it, it was made for hotels. So it, 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 it seems a lot more intuitive for growing a, a, a portfolio. You can have a group login and things like that. Um, so. And yeah. have you found your relationship with booking.com and how helpful they are improving as you've grown in scale and therefore perhaps having an account manager um, or, or have you always kind of experienced quite positive? Yeah, we all, I've always quite liked them. And, you know, even the, the fact of being able to take um, deposits and getting guests car details where you can sort of manage a booking yourself instead of it gets paid to Airbnb and then they decide if you're going to get the money or not. It's, you just feel like, or I feel like I've got a lot more control over our bookings through booking.com. Um, obviously a lot older company as well. They've got a lot more experience. Airbnb are very disruptive in the way they came along and, and I'm sure tried to do things differently. But um, yeah, for me, booking.com just seemed, it seems like the big boy leagues, you know, and even more so the fact that anyone who does any sort of short-term rental service accommodation will be on Airbnb, but a tiny fraction of those people go to, go to booking.com. So you're, you're, it's a less crowded marketplace and it's easier to stand out. Whereas I would argue far more guests use booking.com than Airbnb. So it's sort of win-win. Okay. Charlotte? It's really tricky for me, to be honest. Um, although, yes, the niche kind of OTAs such as finance retreats is a very smooth onboarding process. They do everything. for It's like white glove service. It's very nice. But then it's, it's pretty difficult because I think where my difficulties with the OTAs are is, for example, I like Airbnb in terms of guest quality they make my life a lot easier than a booking.com guest who make honestly my life feel like living hell <laughs> to be totally honest <laughs> however both those platforms are pretty good like you said Dave there is a sense of control with the booking.com guest in terms of you take the pre or for your security deposit and nobody's going to argue with you about whether you're getting that money or not Although with Airbnb, for me, the reason why it wins is I feel like I can still control my guests to, to a certain amount in terms of giving them a really nice experience through our automated messaging and things like that. Um, the, yes, the only downside being Airbnb have the final say in a lot of things. Um, but so far, Touchwood have been very lucky. I've had quite a good relationship with them. I seem to, you know, get what the business needs really out of airbnb so they do really work for us okay that's interesting i i share your views actually charlotte uh, my experience with airbnb is a, is a lot better than booking.com in terms of the guest quality um what about you matt my favorite channel is a brand new one called word of mouth <laughs> and word of mouth Sounds a little funny, but it's a channel. Direct bookings are a channel. Uh, there's ways to feed that mm -hmm. upper, upper funnel with paid advertising and search engine optimization and blogging and all these things. Uh, newsletter is one of my favorite. But direct bookings, and more specifically, word of mouth, led us to the most organic, high-quality, respectful, awesome people, awesome guests, of like-minded referrals that we could have hoped for. I would prefer one word of mouth referral booking to three that came in completely unpredictably through an OTA any day. That's really interesting. And I, I suppose that's um, something that, as you say, organically has been built up over time. So it probably looks quite different to when you first started, although don't know if Airbnb perhaps was in existence. Was it? Was it fourteen no, years it ago? Wasn't. No, it wasn't. That's so, perhaps where, yeah, where I got my cut my teeth. Mm. Um, but for that exact reason, I think I just was taught from the very beginning that there's OTAs and they're incredible. The potential to reach this many people in the world as a small business owner is completely remarkable. But it shouldn't be the core center of your strategy. Mm -hmm. And the moment, like Dave said, you start asking yourself, how's that gonna start working for me? It tends to fall on the, on the focus list 
and you start looking at stuff that is in your control that does act, act on your terms. And it's a, a shift in thinking, but I think it's very powerful for an independent vacation rental manager. That's super helpful, thank you. Right, so in terms of uh, you're actually uh, listing on your OTAs and, uh, and the writing of your descriptions and your titles, have you got some sort of do's and don'ts uh, that might be helpful to share with, with others? Maybe a couple of do's, a couple of don'ts. Uh, Matt, you're not on uh, mute, so I'm gonna go to you first. <laughs> So I have, uh, I developed a um, theory called the theory of limited edition. Mm -hmm. And it's built on the principles of uh, antiques that are very limited in supply, are rich in personality, command top dollar, and create their own marketplaces as opposed to competing with commodity objects. The theory of limited edition applied to vacation rentals is comprised of three main pillars, family owned and operated, locally based, i.e. not headquartered in some other state or country, and specialized in a particular property type or geography. So those three things, family, local, and specialized, should not just be, in my opinion, the center of an independent vacation rental manager's business model. They need to be repeated almost ad nauseum in our copywriting and our outward facing communications. So I like to recommend using the words family, local, and specialized several times, almost seems like you're redundant in your descriptions, in your titles, and something really interesting happens people start using those same words in their inquiries to you. They say, that's really interesting that you're a family owned company. I have a family owned company too. We sell blankets in New Jersey. They say, oh, you're locally based there. Thank goodness, because the company I was speaking with previously is headquartered in, in, elsewhere. Oh, you're specialized in these particular types of properties. That's exactly what we're looking for. The only way you can crack that is to literally use those three words, or if you have other words that are central to your DNA, to use them repeatedly, almost ad nauseum, in your listing titles and descriptions. Do that, and you'll start to find that the people are using those words right back in their inquiries. That's right. It, I guess that's the blending then of the values or the 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 type of. Uh, offering you have and the guests that you want if you start repeating some of those words it will mirror back and people will resonate with it and yeah that's uh I've taken my notes that's very good <laughs> uh Charlotte do you uh do you yeah. have some views uh my views would be who is your customer uh for me I have an amazing copywriter she's brilliant so all of I would say my listings are beautifully written because of the brand that we have However, I think the style differs for the type of property and the type of customer that I am marketing it to. So for example, my Peterborough flats will be very kind of dulled back versus my properties with hot tubs where they are more leisure, they are expensive. You know, I feel like almost as you said, Matt, is keywords like family, local, you know, things like that. I feel like I'm really selling a story and the dream and an idea to the customer on these particular leisure products. Whereas for a contractor, I'm kind of telling you the benefits. I'm really a bit more snappy because these people are quickly reading what they're, what are they getting out of their stay? What are their amenities, facilities and all of that? So parking, they just want it straight to the point. Whereas I feel like if you're approaching a family, you're selling them, you're selling a dream, basically a memory, an idea. So for me, it depends on the listing. It depends on my guest avatar for that particular property, because we obviously, we build the property around the specification of what type of guest I believe will be going to that area, type of property and so on. But yeah, they do differ for us. Thanks, Charlotte. And Dave? I love what Matt said there, I've written that down. Um, and to be perfectly honest, in terms of the listing descriptions, 
I give it not much thought. I, in my, sometimes in my opinion, I think that guests are motivated by the photos that they see, um, which will click them into the listing. And then they look at reviews and price. And I think that's, that's your descriptions right there is the reviews. That's what people know they're going to get. But I, I, I do know that people do tend to read through some of them. And I think if, I, if we were going to focus more on it, it would be like what Charlotte said about talk about their holiday, the holiday they're going to have, not that you've got an iron board, Netflix, uh -huh. fast Wi-Fi, talk about the memories they're going to make. So um, but one thing I do, I do do is in the property name, I put our brand in there. So I call it Centre Belfast Apartments, mm -hmm. Salisbury Centre Belfast Apartments, this. And that, I think for the savvy travellers out there, and I think there are an awful lot of savvy travellers, will see, oh, that's a Centre Belfast Apartments. I wonder, do they have their own website? If they're, if they're big enough to be a company name and it doesn't just say two-bedroom house and city centre location, they might look for that and expect to get a discount, which they will find if they land on our website. Um, and it also is really nice whenever you have lots of properties in the same area that it just says Centre Belfast Apartments across a huge amount of the search results where people think, okay, these guys know what they're doing here. Um, Another thing that I like to do, which is very cheeky, and I wouldn't recommend anyone does it, but I've done a video on it on YouTube, is you can hijack booking.coms. Um, so you, it, it writes you the automated blurb based on what you tick in their, in their boxes, but it does give you a descriptions box where you can write something in it. And I just write in capital letters, go to our website and you will get a cheaper rate. <laughs> 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 All right, that is bold. I did a video about that maybe three years ago and, and and shared it and people were like you can't do that you're gonna get banned that's they're gonna they're gonna kick you off the site and I was like well one their algorithm isn't reading it so no one's gonna find it because they just it put, let you post whatever you want um and two they're not gonna kick you off the site we're cash cows for them all they'll do is tell me to change it and if they do then I will but they haven't and that's like three years over dozens and dozens of properties so yeah, not recommend you do that just in case <laughs> it's kicked off, but that's what I've done. <laughs> that's it. In our photo listings, we've got um, contest, contact us directly to discuss specific requirements. We kept it really generic, but there's our email phone number. On Airbnb, you can publish the photo, and that's um, you can see that in the listing. Booking.com, they know, and they won't allow it. So um, I hadn't got a workaround to... Uh, I, might, I haven't been I might now. Yet for booking now because um, we popped the logo on all of our pictures watermarked uh, and the logo just sits there and it does clearly say the website and the telephone number. And they've not picked up on it? Nope. Ah, might know, we also did that um, and they did pick up on some of ours at some point. So there is an algorithm checking that, but there isn't one checking the description. descriptions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Matt, are you going to come in with something? Um. Yes, I was going to say um, unique home names can, can achieve the same uh, outcome. So Central Belfast Apartments, that's a big keyword, I'm guessing, and that's fairly competitive. Um, and it's also a little bit generic. Uh, so you need might in order to rank when somebody sees Central uh, Belfast Apartments in the listing for that term in an independent Google search. But if you have a company name that's completely unique or a property name that's completely unique, let's just say uh, the Zivu Bungalow. I guarantee nothing exists called the Zivu Bungalow. And you seed that throughout the listing, then the, the organic search challenge is significantly easier because there's no competition. This isn't resolving the fact that a listing site might try to outbid you, like Dave said earlier, uh, but that's a good little um, limited edition positioning idea, repeating uh, in order to achieve this billboard effect. Okay, thank you. So I am conscious of time and I know we've got a, a few questions that have come up in the chat, which we will pick up in the Q and A. Uh, we'll just do a final, uh, final one and is there any advice you give to people around the downsides on listing on the wrong OTA so I guess in your experience have there been certain OTAs or things that you've done on OTAs that are a big sort of downside um, that 
you might want to share your experience to allow others not to not to do that um, well, i would agree with charlotte okay. and the fact that you get some serious dodgy people coming through booking.com <laughs> they are some of them are just absolutely horrible and i think um it does give it a bad name and people are are right to be nervous about going on there um you really have to be streetwise if you're going on to that platform um there are ways that you can sort of mitigate those dangers but those dangers fully exist mm -hmm. um, in terms of other otas i would say only go on ones that are going to fit nicely into your system and not um just swamp you confuse you take up too much of your time you want things in this business to be systemized and um easily replicated and for you to do almost seamlessly you do not want to be adding on a new ta if it doesn't fit into your channel manager or if it's going to take up far too much time okay thank you charlotte did you want to add anything to that um ota wise the cons of them i don't other than you know difficult guests I don't think there can be a con because it is your free marketing in reality, whether you're getting bookings from them or not. Um, I just think I wouldn't, I wouldn't overwhelm yourself. I think if you really know your guest avatar, you know who you're really marketing, you kind of know what OTAs they are picking and choosing to book from. So for me, because I'm so close to Cambridge, sea trip makes sense for me. I'm close to an American base, Verbo makes perfect sense for me. But I wouldn't necessarily, you know, for my area in Huntingdonshire, Expedia just does not work. Whereas in Peterborough, it does better because of the business traveler type and they choose Expedia and booking.com. I, in my, cons wise i just don't go crazy there's no need to list yourself absolutely everywhere it's it's because it's time money and energy as well regardless of whether you're having a va do it or yourself doing it it's i think you can be quite have a nice strategic plan as long as you know your guest and i suppose it's that kind of 80 20 rule isn't it there can be a, a sense you need to list everywhere because you'll miss a particular booking but like you're saying it's uh a balance between upfront effort, time, energy, and if the OTAs are always changing, to maybe select a few that work well for your your particular um, customer and, or location. You know, and sometimes some of these OTAs just get lost in your email. And uh, for example, you may magically have a double booking and uh, being there done that with an older OTA, um, an OTA that I completely forgot about and some lovely guests turned up. Luckily I had a backup property, but you know, it does happen, especially if you've like, if from the beginning, you think that's a genius idea, you kind of forget about it. Um, yeah. It's just one of those things like no need to go mad. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, did you have some My, Mine is, yeah, just a, uh, underlining no need to go mad. Um, one, know the costs of a bad OTA experience, uh, whether it's with a guest or the OTA itself, know what that is like, know what that can cost. Uh, and two, know your cost per acquisition, what's great. And don't mistake, don't let the ease of using these tools, don't make the mistake of associating that with success. Because while it might be temporary, you are building on another platform. So, so long as you're aware that listing sites and OTAs are a fantastic way to generate new bookings and you're allowing them to work for you, working towards a larger plan that you have crafted, the more you start thinking about these things, the more these decisions become easier. Suddenly you realize, well, I'd actually prefer way fewer bookings that are much higher quality that I'm directly interacting with. If that's the goal to achieve two years from now, listing sites have a very particular role. So I think understanding what you want from your business and then where these OTAs fit, I think is changing the chip. It's changing your entire uh, perspective. Mm, it's definitely taking that longer term view, isn't it, Matt, rather than the uh, we're listing, we're getting bookings, because I think as a number of us experienced during COVID and platforms kind of shutting calendars, um, you know, that was pivotal in terms of how people were doing business. 
So I, uh, conscious of time and giving people opportunity uh, for participating to ask some questions uh, and for us to answer. Um, just to let people know as well, this is being recorded, so it will be shared um, after. I'm not quite sure how, email or you'll be notified, so there will be a recording um, for folks. Um, so in terms of questions, if people feel comfortable to unmute, uh, maybe put their video on so we can see you, um, have any burning questions, then please feel free to. There is one in the chat, which... Uh, from Kieran, so we'll kick off with that one, give people time to unmute and visualize. Um, so Kieran's asked, what's the best way to set policies within booking.com, uh, uh, i.e. for guest ID verification? Um, that's, I don't think that's a binary question. There's not one, uh, one option, or at least in my experience, one option of this is how you set the policies. Because booking.com um, is Dave's favorite, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and over to Dave, yeah. <laughs> didn't realize it was going to be a test on the action. <laughs> so collect policies and then collect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the question is how do you actually say that we need verification, is it? Or is it what is the best way that guests I, expect that, you know, you, you might want to take those? Um, I, I interpreted, and Kieran, if you're still on, feel free to jump on in. I interpreted it more around... Um, what's the best way to set policies so that you can make sure that your guests are being verified and there's an additional verification. But that's something that's quite important to me. So I might be putting um, words into Kieran's mouth. Yeah, so obviously on, on Airbnb, you can set that up so that you can only allow bookings from guests with um, verified ID. You can't on booking.com, the, the booking will come in. You can then ask for it, ask to see the ID of everyone that's staying there. It's up to you to sort of decide whether you want to verify that or not. Um, again, in the in the descriptions bit, there are lots of little tick boxes at the bottom that says that you, you re will request the ID from guests, so it shouldn't be a surprise for them. I know that there's one program, we don't use it, but there is a program out there that does that on your behalf. It's Superhog that you plug in the email address and it basically sends out emails until the guests upload that ID to the system, to their system. Um, we use that mainly for, for age, you know, I don't, I don't care if someone is called John, they booked under the name John, but it's Chris that's then as much. Um, but the age is, is one thing we do. We don't want, as was during the pandemic, a load of kids trying to book because it was their first, their first trip away in a few years and they were just booking so we were asking for ids to check their age okay charlotte matt do you have uh, any views around um booking.com and how you might set the policies no i don't spend any of my time learning or talking about listing site policies for no <laughs> No, I I think in terms of answering that one, I think Dave Dave got it. Um, I think Kieran's popped in. He uses Superhog too. Uh, so there's another question in. Uh, that's from, is it Sab? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, some hosts claim that they change part of their listing information on the OTAs on a daily basis, so that basically. It appears to the OTAs like it's a very active listing. It boosts the kind of the, the ranking and therefore it appears first in the search results. Um, so is that true? Does this tactic really work? So uh, Charlotte, I'll come to you first. Um, mm, it's a hard one. Um, yes, it does work i have done that where you know i do shift to change something change picture around uh play with the rates whether it goes up or down you know changes i feel like do help but you know there's only so many i feel like i can make in a week and again to me is it it's time money and energy if you've got a va you know tweaking a listing here and there's you know there's no real issues but I think really 
if you're not being booked up, there could be other reasons why, not just down to the algorithm. Is it your pictures? Is it the listing, your reviews mm -hmm. and things like that? There could be more to it. But yes, from personal experience, playing with the OTAs uh, regularly does help. Okay. Dave? Um, yeah, I'm sure it does. I would just sort of say, is it worth it to be doing that on a daily basis? I think there are other much more powerful ways to bump yourself up the search result rankings. Um, one of them, which will be sacrilege to a lot of people, is, is offering one night stays. So the more you show up in search results, the more the, the booking sites like that and they will show you. So Again, I did a video on this a long time ago where you, if you can create a rate plan, I don't think it's possible in Airbnb, create a rate plan that's one night stay, but the price is super, super sky high. So you, you will show up in the search results, but no one's ever going to book it. It's too high. Um, that gives you the boost. So the vast majority of searches on all the booking sites are for one night. And if you can show up in that one night for all of those searches, you get a bump in every other search for two nights, three nights, four nights. Um, other bigger things that I think will play a part as opposed to tweaking words or phrases in a listing is your click through, which um, as Charlotte said is your photos. So if you show up in the search results, having an attractive price, it's competitive, but also a wow photo that someone says, I have to see the rest of these photos. Um, that's your click through rate. And then the conversion rate off the back of that. So once they're actually in the listing and they've read through and they've read about the family owned and you're locally based and you're specialized um, and then they book, that is the big thing because effectively the booking sites want bookings to come through as seamlessly as possible for guests. So they want to show in their eyes, the best places at the top. Um, and if you can have a strong click-through rate and a strong conversion, the book and the OTA is going to think your, your place is amazing. Thank you. Matt? Uh, yes, it does uh, affect uh, logging in, making adjustments does affect. I, uh, I have a whole room full of uh, monkeys that I have trained to log into my listing site once a day, make a small adjustment, and they're so well trained that it's a little adjustment, not a big one something that doesn't really uh, impact, but that achieves the goal. So if anybody would like to use my services, happy to offer those out. Thank you. I um, My experience is actually I use Price Labs. Um, so Price Labs is, a, is, in my view, it's pennies uh, for the benefits. Um, it automate, automatically updates every day. My experience, in, and I operate in an area where there's not a huge amount of competition, so I will just caveat what I say, but we're always number one or number two in the listings um, in terms of searching. Um, the pricing allows it to flex and change with the competition. You can also set um, some really interesting uh, kind of parameters in terms of one night stays, so orphan stays, if you're saying, Dave, and we put a premium on those. So we don't often get them. I don't want them. Um, but, you know, if somebody wants to pay double the you know, the equivalent of a two night stay in one night, then, you know, I'm happy to do that. Um, also, you can do far out bookings. So things that are one month, two months, nine, you know, 90 days, whatever your parameters are, where minimum stays are seven nights, etc. So you can still keep yourself available for potentially longer term bookings, as well as using the pricing um, for, you know, being much more competitive and offer discounts on it. I find it's one of the best integration tools that um, I use, it, it hooks back to Zivu, um, but it's brilliant because it keeps all my listings up to date. And it, it, as I say, my experience is we're always top of the listing, but the only caveat is we, we operate in an area that's not high competition. So we, in West Midlands, um, not Birmingham, but where I am, there's probably a maximum of 20 operators. So uh, yeah. And also, I think your point, Dave, about um, using booking.com to make sure your property score is high and, and things like that, that does really obviously um, help. So the other question we have is from Pamela. Uh, because Airbnb scares the hell out of guests with a repeat message of saying, staying on the platform and communicating and never giving your email, I have difficulty getting guests to book direct from this platform. We do auto messaging, sign up for newsletter, repeat guest discounts and so on, but I get a very low percentage of participants there. 
anybody have a trick for capturing that guest routinely? And um, Pamela, I'm not sure if you're talking about the conversion of guests that are booking on Airbnb and then converting them into direct, or whether you're talking about repeat bookings and those being direct. Um, I'm gonna, if you're, if you're on Pamela, oh, the first one. So these are people then that have booked on Airbnb and then you approach them to convert them into direct. Um, I'll open it up. That's not something I do. Um, but uh, Charlotte, but, well, Matt, sorry, your hands up. Yeah, I'll give a shout out to a company called Stayfy. Uh, it's email marketing built into your Wi-Fi, like any hotel. And all you need is the device. And suddenly you're asking guests to type in their email address to access your internet. Nobody has any issues doing that, despite what you may be concerned about. And you're also able to capture more than just the person who booked. You're capturing anybody who's using uh, the Wi-Fi. That alone allows you to build a, uh, an email marketing list that you can remarket to. I see that device as one of the singular uh, best microcosms of, a, of an independent marketing portfolio. You're taking everything that's wonderful about the OTAs, wrapping it up into your own court, thanks to this tool, um, and then making sure you're doing a good job of following up. That's a, an amazing tool. If you're not using it, definitely look it up. So that's uh, Stay FI, Stay FI. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Dave, Charlotte? Yeah, this is a genius question, really, uh, especially to do with the conversion from straight from Airbnb. Okay, so a lot of people will say this is unethical to do uh, just because Airbnb has technically bought you a guest and now you're taking it away from them uh, through, you know, ways that they don't want you to do it. So a lot of people do talk about this as being an unethical method. However, there are ways that you can do it. So uh, Matt actually mentioned one of them is talking about the property name, having a killer name, um, because guests are getting a bit savvy. Having a killer name with your brand next to it, if they dump it into Google, just copy paste, dump that into Google, you know, you hope that they're doing that. You could also use your imagery. Um, I know a few hosts that just go crazy out there and they've got a picture of a TV, a laptop or like a coffee setup station and then clearly their branding and then with the um, written bit underneath saying, uh, you know, book direct. Another thing that you can do is utilize your listing and say, um, again, it's dependent on how, um, because there could be a chance, it's a risk that Airbnb do pick this up or booking.com. I don't think with booking.com, you can actually play with the listing. I think it's already set for you. But with Airbnb, uh, you could say like receive, it depends if you're giving a discount or whatever it is, receive a hamper when you book direct with us. So you could push the customer that way. I don't really want to recommend that in terms of, you know, you should do it. It's because it's, you know, Airbnb may pick up on it. You may get away with it for a while. You can do it. Another way you could do it is within the messaging, but you have to be ever so careful. You could use things like um, if you wish to receive discounts, go find us on our socials. Or another term that I've seen being used is, use your favorite uh, search engine to find us because these things don't pick up because you're not using terms like Google and stuff like that. Um, it's a risk that you play with because if Airbnb really don't like it, you know, they can close your accounts. Um, but sometimes it's almost better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Hey. Absolutely, Charlotte. I, <laughs> right on, right on. And I think that's what Pamela meant as well. Once they've booked, how do you get them off and get them into our direct booking? Um, it is super easy to do on booking.com. You can literally just send them an email saying, here, do you want a discount? Just cancel this booking. It, you obviously do get penalized in that and your, your cancellation rate plays into your search results, which we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to weigh up whether it's worth it. With Airbnb, 
it's super hard because even if the guest cancels, they don't always necessarily get all their money back, um, even if you have it as a full full cancellation. So it can be really difficult on that platform. I've actually tried doing that on TripAdvisor before, sending little messages like, like Charlotte said, and their algorithm is even stricter than Airbnb's and we got punished. We got caught and punished. Like Airbnb will just sort of tell you, don't do that again, but TripAdvisor caught us um, and yeah, we got in trouble for that. I think our listing got deactivated for a little while. So you're playing with fire. Mm. I would say pick and choose who you do it with. If it's an absolutely incredible booking, you know, thousands of pounds, I would say save it for that. Whereas if it's a two night, 200, 300 pound booking and you've got loads of those, maybe if you're going to be doing it on an industrial scale, you might be running a fine line. And I suppose also on the um, on the smaller bookings to make it worth their time cancelling um, and actually Airbnb are very good in terms of the deposits that they or the insurance that they have in case you've got kind of damage if you're not taking your own deposit on the smaller bookings you've got to make it worth the guests while to cancel and then you're going to be offering some sort of discount which actually means the commission is hugely reduced um, in, in real terms in terms of um, what you're saving so yeah you're right in terms of the bigger bookings it's probably worth saving your efforts for that one yeah and it can be scary for guests you know the, these fake scam listings exist um and that is how they get scammed is they they'll book and and people say oh give, you know come book with us direct and give us your money direct to us and and people lose money on that so it's understandable why some guests yeah. think i'll just stay in the safety net of airbnb or booking yeah i think that is all our questions and we're pretty much smack on time um just checking no, no more's going to come through um that i've, I've learned loads so hopefully others have to <laughs> i've taken lots and lots of notes i found that super interesting mm -hmm. um and i've just made a, a few notes in terms of sort of some I guess key take homes, but you know, Dave, Matt, Charlotte, if you want to add in, feel free. Um, but some of the stuff just for the benefit of, of those um, participating was around um, OTAs and which ones you're choosing. Um, there are, you know, tens, if not hundreds of OTAs you can list on. So look for one um, that works for your business, that, that suits your location, that suits your customer, rather than trying to list on all of them because they change so frequently. You want to be maximizing the opportunities on, on those OTAs. Um, and the other thing is actually try and create a relationship with the OTAs and call for advice or tips on how you can perhaps maximize your, your bookings, your listings, as um, Charlotte mentioned. Um, I think OTAs are very much a personal preference. Um, uh, I'm not a fan of booking, Dave, you are. Uh, I'm a fan of Airbnb. Um, that's because I like the particular guests. Um, I think probably on booking.com, you're saying you've got more control. Um, and Matt, your word of mouth um, uh, kind of prevails. So I think really some of the OTAs is about exploring them, using them, and then it, it's down to personal preference because they do all operate differently they all have very different functionalities and depending on what's really important to you it might be the quality of guests or the guest verification process um, the fact that airbnb have got insurance or it might be on booking.com that actually um, they do they have got a bigger marketing reach and um, if you dave like you're saying if bookings get cancelled they get rebooked fairly quickly so they they have a um you know, there, there's much more of an opportunity to get bookings. So I think OTAs, as we talked about, a bit more of a personal preference. Um, one of the big things that we've talked about is about not just the conversion of bookings, but but the direct direct bookings and direct marketing. Um, so using the OTAs, I suppose, to put your brand out there. Um, so in your listing, you might have your brand name. So people then might start to Google you and, and that might drive more direct bookings. Um, as Matt was saying, put unique name in the title. That helps obviously with the searching. Um, using things like Stay Wi-Fi to capture people's addresses so that you start to build up your own database of those direct um, uh, 
of the, those individuals staying at your property so that you can convert them to direct bookings. Um, knowing your customer is really, really, really key. Um, and as Matt talked about, using words repeatedly so that you start to um, resonate with the particular ideal clients that you want or the ideal guests that you want to come, um, come and stay with you. I think those were all of my key points that I made, but uh, Charlotte, Matt, Dave, if you've got a kind of a, a parting words of wisdom, feel free to jump on in. Um, I think for me, I would, I would say like, like, I would echo what you said, Naomi, the OTAs are, are amazing. They're here to stay, they're not gonna go away. But like Matt said, you know, we need to be thinking about ourselves and not get too comfortable on there. This is our business, it's not theirs. Um, these are our guests, even though they come through there. So we need to try and build some sort of a brand that in a tiny little way can rival the big OTA so that guests can trust um, us and book with us direct. Thank you. Charlotte, you're unmuted. 100%, just back in what Dave said. I have nothing else to add, but thank you so much for hosting, Naomi. And it was lovely to meet you, gents. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Charlotte. Matt? Me too. Yep, same from me. My big takeaway is sometimes you should follow Dave, sometimes you should not. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It sounds like it might be the catchphrase. Um, so I think also uh, the surveys popped up too. Silver's just message to say that. Um, so if folk could complete that, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, this has been recorded, so we will share it. Um, and obviously feel free to reach out to any, all or one of us uh, if you need, uh, need anything. So thank you so much, Dave, Matt, Charlotte. I've not met you before, but um, I will be contacting you outside of this and great to meet you. And thank you, Zivu, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone.